So good morning. I'm just going to talk super loud for the people on Facebook and Zoom because we're having sound issues again. We can't remember how Stephen, and thank you, Stephen, for setting up a temporary fix. We can't remember how he did it last week. So we're going to work on that. You have to get, get directions from Stephen. I don't know if you can see behind me. I'm going to try to move out of the way a little bit. But um, Art put the flowers on the altar. They're beautiful red roses or carnations. Roses from here for his anniversary art and his anniversary, their 20th anniversary. So we don't normally point that out, but since it's kind of hard to see the flowers on Facebook and Zoom, I thought I would point that out. Um, something new, but you should have seen it in the bulletin last week. They're having a um, Bible study, actually, not they, Vicar Ellen is having a Bible study on Philippians and St. Paul's journey on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock, beginning September the 16th. So you still have time to join. Mm -hmm. It'll be on Facebook and Zoom. So um, definitely, if you're interested, contact Lisa or Vicar Ellen so she can get you the study guide to go along with it. Um, we're still doing our take some leave some box. So if you would like to donate anything, there you know definitely get that up to church. You can leave it in the box itself if you don't want to come in the building. Offering still the same ways, and thanks everybody for keeping that up. <coughs> rally day. We're gonna have not a Sunday school rally day because of this wonderful pandemic. We're changing a lot of things, and one of them is rally day. So Rally Day this year will be the entire church, not just the Sunday school. So if you have any special talents or skills that you would like to donate to make our Rally Day extra wonderful, please contact Victor Ellen. It can be anything from a craft to a song to a dance to artwork. I know some of our kids really like mm -hmm. artwork. But we could show their artwork if they would like to do that. For some reason, I didn't print all my announcements, but that looks like it's it. Not all my announcements printed out, so. Oh, I know why, because oh, I sent it front and back. Yeah. <laughs> Let me flip it over. Upcoming events, the newsletter. If you have anything for the newsletter, I did them out of order. Sorry, people who are here in person, because I wasn't smart enough to flip the paper over. So newsletter, if you have anything for the newsletter, we are working on getting that out. We're set, we were saying September, but now we might shoot more towards the end of September, beginning of October. Social media, um, check out our Facebook page. Thank you to Karen and Kathleen for doing an awesome job there. And I know Vicar Allen's kind of jumped in with some things. Her team continued, Grace and Barbara. You know about our worship service. And don't forget, I like to show them a little bit our copyright rules for the songs that we use. So that ends the announcements for today. Today is a pretty important theme. It's about conflict. And we know that conflict is part of our world and part of our own lives. In fact, I, I did teach literature my whole life as a teacher, and literature isn't literature without conflict. We're just not used to a world or even a story without conflict. Life in community, according to Jesus, has lots of conflict. And Jesus' word, words in today's gospel are often used in situations that have to do with conflict, even in our church. The prophet Ezekiel tells a warning the wicked to turn from their ways. And Paul reminds us that love is the fulfilling of the law. We gather in the name of Christ, assured that he is present among us with the gifts of peace and reconciliation. I want to say before we begin that we have more people than ever here at church, and it's so wonderful. So thank you all for coming. So now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, 
whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Let us confess now our sins in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and we rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our benefit we fear difference and we do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, woo us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life you give us. Amen. Most beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy and forgive, forgiveness, we have peace with God through Christ. Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained priceless grace. Our sins are forgiven and we begin again with a clean slate. Let us now live in hope, for hope never, never disappoints. Hope is the anchor for our souls and we love others because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is Children of the Heavenly Father. The first reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. The introduction. God appointed Ezekiel as a sentinel for the house of Israel. 
Ezekiel must faithfully convey God's warnings to the people. Remarkably, God, who is about to attack Jerusalem, gives warning with the hope that repentance will make the attack unnecessary. The word. So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways. The wicked shall die in their iniquity. But their blood will be, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Our psalm for today is Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your teaching. I shall keep it with all my heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Incline my heart to your decrees and not to unjust gain. Turn my eyes from beholding falsehood. Give me life in your way. Fulfill your promise to your servant, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the reproach that I dread, because your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your commandments. By your righteousness, enliven me. The second reading is from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. The obligation of Christians is to love one another and so fulfill the heart and the goal of the law. Clothes make the person as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and live today in the light of the future God has in store for us. The Word. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably, as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Here ends the reading. The Gospel today is from Matthew. Jesus offers practical advice to his disciples on how individuals and the church as a whole should go about restoring relationships when one member has sinned against another. Jesus said to the disciples, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. 
But if you are not listened to, one or two others, take them along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And the offender refuses to listen to them, if that happens, then you must let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. That's the gospel of the Lord. <sighs> you know, in seminary, we learned that a little piece of verse cut off from a larger piece is called a periphery. And you can study that little piece as though it is a full word. And that little piece that I want to bring up today is if two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Because that is worship. Worship is fellowship. Worship happens where two or three, or hopefully more, like we have today, are gathered together to worship and pray and sing and hear a sermon and do all the kinds of wonderful things we do in worship. Do you know why worship's important? We were created to worship. God created us in such a way that we were made for worship. Worship comes from the Greek word meaning worth-ship. If something is worth praise and honor and glory, then we must worship. And who is worth it except God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Who is worth our worship except God? the triune God, not things. And yet that's what we tend to worship, as though they are worth it. Our job, our, our, sometimes even our family, you know. Our, there, there's so many things we worship um, that, you know, are not worth it. But when we worship that which is worth it, we are fulfilled. We are no longer empty. We are no longer seeking for things to make us happy that only last for a little while. I remember before I found Christ, I would seek anything for a, a happiness, like even riding a roller coaster or riding a um, Ferris wheel. Or I think, well, that will make me happy for so long. And I'd ride it, and then it would be over, and I'd think, hmm. But it lasted five minutes, and I just, I think vacation doesn't do it. I count every day, and I think, ugh, I only last a week. I planned for so long, and nothing did it. But once I found Christ, I never was empty again. I really wasn't because of worship and because of all the good, wonderful things we were created for that finally I had. So let's think about worship, and let's start at the very beginning. Once we enter the space where we will worship, whatever that space may be, can be a home, can be the church, wherever the worship happens, that space becomes sacred and powerful. Did you ever think of that? That when you enter this church to worship, Anywhere you enter for worship, that space is now enclosed by the Spirit of God. That's 100% true. 100% true. When we come into this space to worship, God is not socially distant. God is right there. You are so close that you are face to face. And even better than face to face, God is in you through the Holy Spirit, walking beside you through Jesus, and next to you to hold you from all the sadness and suffering that you've gone through for the week, to comfort you, 
so many times I felt held. I felt so like encompassed in every way. The God's above me to protect me, below me even to watch where my feet are going so I don't stumble in front of me to make sure my path is, is on the, the right way beside me in case I'm suffering from whatever's happening behind me to make sure no forces come against me. I feel encompassed. And of course within me to make sure I have strength. Can you think about that for a moment? And just think about what it means to be that encompassed by someone, a spirit that loves you so much that God will not let you go. And we pray that in the beginning and the end. Nothing can separate us from God. That spirit that lives in us and with us created us and loves us beyond anything else. Anything. So that is pretty cool when we enter our worship space. That we are face to face with our creator who loves us. Now, here's even more exciting part of worship. The minute... I say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the minute that is said, the full triune God enters you fully, right? Here, no questions asked. The power of that spirit enters you and this whole room. And from that point on in this worship, we are in kinship, in God's kinship which is kind of the Greek word for kingdom. All our worship comes from ancient times. And the, the words that we use are from other languages. And in the Greek, we are now kin of God, daughters, sons, brothers and sisters of Christ. We are in the family. We are already in God's kinship and kingdom. Now, what's part of worship? Liturgy. Now, some people are like, I don't know about liturgy. I don't know. We repeat the same things. Well, believe it or not, liturgy creates. It is not just something we repeat. Liturgy is at the heart of worship, and it creates our culture, our meaning, and our identity as Lutherans. Why do we repeat? Because it gets inside us. The more we repeat those words, the more we remember that Christ lives in us through the Holy Spirit. It creates our culture, our meaning. It creates our identity as Lutherans who worship. Liturgy means the work of the people done for the sake of the world. It's public work for the needs of others in the community as Jesus requires. We never think of liturgy like that, do we? But that's the literal meaning of the word. We always think, ah, it's just the church repeating words. Well, it isn't. It's power. It's the power that we have to repeat the words of God so that they become in us power to do good work. Because literally in Hebrews 8, 6, here's the verse. In Greek, it translates to... Jesus shows liturgy to people and God. That's what it translates to. Jesus showing liturgy to people and God. Because liturgy literally means in the Greek, worship and mission. Worship and mission. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Our mission and our worship. And guess what? Also intended in the word liturgy in the Greek is service to and from God. To and from God. So we are serving God, but God is serving us. God is giving us power and courage and all the food that we need inside us. The faith, the hope. The feelings of, of encouragement to keep us going. The wings of the eagle so that we will be strong and have energy and, and the needed hope to get through illnesses. And, and it says you will not faint. You will have energy and renewal. 
I love to think of what God gives me, you know, even more than what I can give God. What I can give God is paltry compared to what God can give me. Now, here's exciting news also about worship. Now, all this is intended from the Bible. I'm not making this up. This is all from the Bible if you read the ancient texts in Hebrew and Greek. In worship, when we say, peace be with you, or sometimes we'll say, God be with you, sweetheart, God be with you for what you're going through, those are not empty words. Those are not even kind words. Those are words that literally have the power to send God's spirit into the person you are addressing. Yeah. When you say, God be with you, God's spirit goes into that person and is with that person. When you're worshiping God and so close to God, God answers what you are asking. And when you say, peace be with you, God enters that person and gives peace. God just doesn't sit beside you and, and live in you, and Christ just doesn't die for you. So that when you say to someone, oh, I love you, peace be with you, God just says, eh. No, God loves you so much that God obeys. Jesus said so in our scripture. You do it, you may ask the same thing. God will do it. God's right there to do it. When you love somebody, if you love your grandchild or your child so much, and your child is saying, please, I'm so hungry, please. You say, eh, too bad. No. And God loves us way more than you could ever love your grandchild. We don't even know the kind of agape that God can love. So please know that when you pray for someone else, that prayer does not go unanswered. So. Now, when we read the Bible aloud, again, those words become remembrance for us. It's our way of learning the scripture, but it's our way of making those stories live again through this worship. They become present with us again. So when Jesus says um, with the Eucharist, with the Holy Communion, do this for the remembrance of me, he doesn't mean, ah, remember the story. It happened long ago. He doesn't mean that. He means let it live in you now. Bring that story back right now. Don't think, ah, oh, it happened so long ago. No. When you take that communion, Jesus is in it, and now he's in you. Yes, Jesus doesn't say remembrance in the sense of just remembering your head. He's saying, you live it now with me, just the way I lived it those years ago. So when you take that wine or juice and Bread into you, you're taking the actual spirit of Christ at that moment. And one of the great biblical scholars says it this way. Um, she says, the great, well, she's, her name is Ruth Duck. I love that name. But anyway, she says it this way. The Paschal mystery, right, in reality, that remains inexhaustible even when revealed, and she's talking about the mystery of communion, the Paschal, the Paschal mystery, even, she said, it's never going to be exhausted. It's never going to be worn out. It remains and reveals every time we take communion. She says, in that union with Jesus, in his death and resurrection, Christians experience it through worship but they mostly experience it through communion with him in the Eucharist. So she's saying that we always experience it in worship, our communion with Jesus, but mostly when we take the Eucharist or the Holy Communion um, with Jesus, that's when we really experience oneness with Christ. Woo. She says through worship, we realize the truth and God's true will for us. And our response to God then must be, God, I will do it. And also, she calls worship a rehearsal. I love that. Like, we rehearse loving each other and caring for each other with people we know, people we feel comfortable with. But now, we got to get out in that community and 
start visiting people we, we don't know, people who might reject us. You know, when I, I cold call people sometimes um, from the hospital when I was chaplain, whew, I was always nervous. I knew they were patients at the hospital, but I didn't know how they were going to receive me. You know, but when I call people from the congregation, I know they're going to be, oh, hey, we're so happy you called us. That's rehearsal for when you have to get out there in addition to people who might not be so nice and so kind. I love that she calls it rehearsal. I love that worship is rehearsal. But it's also many other things. It's revelation of God's love. It's ritual that identify us and help us to be the kind of people we should be. And now it's praise. It has to be praise. Guess what? Worship isn't worship without music. Do you believe that? Is that awesome? Yes. Praise is needed for worship. If we don't praise, we don't have worship. Praise and music is so important. And music that fits the theme of the worship is important. Now, in the early church, all the hymns fit the theme. We have psalms that were sung and, and prayed. All of that is needed for worship. Now, I always thought singing was just beautiful because the, the tunes were gorgeous and the words could make you cry. They were so pretty. Until my wonderful mentor, a pastor who brought me to Jesus, Pastor Ed Kushabar, did this amazing sermon. That said, you know, hymns like, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, please don't sing those words if you don't feel that way about Christ. Or, um, you know, I'd love to tell the story. He said, if you're not telling the story, don't sing those words. And he made me realize those words are supposed to be our truth. Those words aren't just written for fun or because they sound pretty and rhyme. No, those words are worship and prayer. Just the way everything else we pray and speak of is important and true. That made me realize hymns are just as much worship as anything else we do. And to believe that hymns are important in worship makes us realize that we gotta sing. So I say from now on we sing quietly behind our mask. We're not gonna spit that much, right? <laughs> So in conclusion, I just want to say that everything we do, according to um, all I've studied about worship, must be done in Jesus' name. That's why we always say in Jesus' name, we pray, etc. Um, and I also love the fact that you cannot leave worship the same way you came in. It's not possible. If you worship truly, you're going to be transformed. You are going to be. It's not possible to leave any, any way except different than the way you came in. And remember that all your words of beauty have power. And because of that, I'm going to wish and pray that all worship will bring you closer to your triune God and bring you peace and bring you blessings, and bring you happiness and joy to worship forever and ever. Worship that will bring you closer to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
I challenge you all from now on to listen to the words of these hymns. Really listen to them. Um, most of us probably know them by heart if we've been in the church for a long time, but whew, they are powerful, beautiful words. They really are. Um, in our Facebook, we're at the children's sermon. So children, if you will listen particularly to this. Um, in, on our Facebook page, we have a prayer for back to school. We did one for teachers since they went back last week, and this week we're doing one for students. And we are praying that all students will find joy in learning, either from home, um, hopefully setting up their own little space, maybe putting up some fun posters to make their little space like a classroom even, um, finding the peace and ability to stay, you know, in, focused and attentive to their computers, um, hopefully finding joy in their own learning and resources that they have around them. I know the schools, the county schools are giving out kits, um, learning kits, so hopefully finding joy in that and making the best of a situation that can be hard without sports, you know, without closeness and going in to be with teachers and friends. Um, I was talking today with Miss Sylvia and we just said we gotta use our imaginations and we gotta make the best of a situation that's challenging us. But with God's help and lots of prayer, we're gonna get through it. We're gonna make the best of it. And know lots of, some kids anyway, are back to school and distancing and wearing their masks and hopefully they'll make the best of a tough situation where they can't be close to their teachers or move around a whole lot. But please, children, know that as you go back to school, if you're afraid, pray. Pray to the Lord because he always gives courage. God always gives courage to those who ask for it. We all are afraid, adults and kids alike. The number one problem in America today when research has gone out to ask is anxiety. People are afraid. So know that God is with you and will help your fears if you ask. Amen. And now the peace of God. Remember, when we give peace, it shoots into the person to whom we give peace. So the peace of God be with all of you. Let's give the peace to all. You can unmute. Say the peace. God, peace be with with you. you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you on Facebook and Zoom. Peace be with Peace be sweetheart. Peace. Peace, Harvey. I'm going to start visiting people. <laughs> Um, there's, again, our offering. We're so blessed that people are sending it in. Every time, again, I go to the mailbox, there's four or five in there, and Lisa collect a bunch, and I collect a bunch, and we're, we're grateful for that. Um, we're grateful for people who put it in our little basket here at church, um, for people who send it in all kinds of ways, um, and thank you. Thank you so much. I am going to say the offering prayer today because in my research, I found out how offering was given and why we pray our offering prayer, why we pray it the way we do. So let us pray. In the time of Martin Luther, 
all the people of the church brought bread and wine along with their tithes as an offering to the Lord. The bread and wine that were chosen for the Eucharist were blessed as they were brought to the altar and the minister raised them up to the Lord. The rest of the meals were given to the poor. Now we continue spiritually to bring ourselves as worship and offering to you, Lord. We are nourished through worship, through reading the gospel, through church music, the sermon, and prayer. We can never repay you, Lord, for your unending grace, but we offer what we can in time, talent, and resources as a result of our unity and communion with you, the triune God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The creed of the church, while written by men, was authorized spiritually by God. So let us say it together in unity. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Unite all of us at St. John's with one great faith and love, O oh God. Grant us the gifts of repentance and reconciliation for all our broken relationships, whether friend, family, or neighbor. Bless the cooperative work of churches in this Essex community as we seek to slowly reopen and resume activities according to your will and our safety. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships all around our globe. Guide the work of Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Renew and enliven places suffering from drought, floods, storms, or pollution, especially the Chesapeake Bay, from which we gain seafood, fellowship, and recreation. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. On this Labor Day weekend, be with all who travel for final summer recreation. Keep us safe on the roads and in the air, and guide our steps to do your will among all whom we encounter. On this weekend, Lord, we honor all who work and pray for all who have lost their jobs, whether temporarily or for the long term. We ask that you would give us all productive employment and a strong work ethic. We especially pray for teachers and students who have already returned to school or are returning this week, whether virtually or in person. Help learning to flourish and the community of educators and students to care for one another. Sustain all of us in our work, O oh God, and give work to those who need it. Shape societies to ensure fair treatment and fair wages for all who labor, especially our first responders who deal each day with COVID-19. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Tend to all in need of your compassion. Hear the cries of those awaiting justice and those yearning for forgiveness. Give community to the lonely and neighbors to the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit. 
all those in need of your healing hands and feet, especially the ones on our prayer list. Amanda, Arlene, Brian, Kobe, Cora, Harry, Jamie, Jeffrey, Jen, Josh, Katie, Marie, Marina, Matt, Molly, Patty, Roy, Scarlett, Skip, William, Avery, Joyce, Natalie, Kenny, Tina, Debbie, Mary, Bert, Sandy, Mel, Karina, Shannon, and their three daughters, and those serving in our military, Andrew, Austin, James, Joseph, Marshall, Sean, Troy, and Vincent, and all those we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in faith. As you equip them, equip us with your protection and power until with them we see your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we continue to pray for those caught in the California wildfires, those who were just rescued but badly injured. Lord, we pray that this summer heat um, that you are now giving us a little respite from um, will not hurt um, people as it has in the past, and that hurricanes and, and uh, major storms will pass without the loss of lives. You know that all our lives are in your hands. Now all these things and whatever else you see that we need, we do entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray the perfect prayer our Jesus Christ, our Savior, has taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now hear the blessing that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Savior, and our Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you now and keep you all in eternal love. Amen. Our sending him go my children with my blessing. Go my children with my blessing. Sins forgiven and peace and pure. Here you learned how much I love you. What can I cure? Here you heard my dear son's story. Here you touched him so his glory. Go, my children, sins forgiven. Go, my children, fed and nourished, go, 
closer to me. Through in love and love, my serving joy, full and free. Hear my spirit's power fill you. Hear my tender comfort still you. Go, my children, friend and nourish joy, full and free. As I have said so many times, Mike picks the perfect hymns. Oh my goodness, this says it all, doesn't it? It talks about the transformation of worship. So now, go in peace. Christ is always with you. <laughs>